Okay, we should be recorded now. Excellent. So perhaps you could let me know if the if the volume is falling off. Oh, most certainly. Yeah, I definitely will. Okay, so uh, we currently have upwards of 25 people on the call, so why don't we get going? It's our traditional couple minutes after start time. Um, it's a distinct pleasure, everyone, to, uh, to be hosting this particular call because uh, the work that's here is near and dear to my heart. Um, the, as you're aware, the PGC schizophrenia paper from 2014 um, really was a landmark. It actually ended up being one of the top two or three most highly cited papers in all of biomedicine from 2014. And it's sort of the, the linchpin of uh, what the PGC can do. Um, and today, James will be talking about analysis that he led, which is uh, essentially uh, taking the PGC2 results and increasing it in several different ways. The, the first, of course, is they came up with a lot more samples, and that led to some um, additional loci. In addition, I believe James and colleagues came up with a new and interesting way to look at the data and have helped us drill down in an important way, I believe, into, into the basic uh, causes of, uh, of schizophrenia. Um, so I think most of us know James from interactions over time. He's a, a consultant psychiatrist and member of the, MA, the MRC Center in Cardiff. And we're certainly super happy in, that he agreed to give us this talk. And at this point, I'll turn it over to you. James, please. Thanks very much, Pat. And thanks to, to Pat and the PGC for this invitation to present our work. Um, so as Pat said, I'm working in Cardiff. You can see our new building there, um, which is an impressive thing and a, a good photo. I hadn't noticed before that it's actually got a no entry sign, uh, which isn't the inclusive and welcoming <laughs> message we want to give, but nonetheless will suffice, I think. So what I'm going to do for the next 40 minutes or so is, is give you an overview of the recent schizophrenia GWAS analysis that we've undertaken. I'll firstly introduce you, for those that don't know, to the CLOS UK sample and talk about an initial GWAS we ran of that sample. Um, and then justification for including this in a meta-analysis with the PGC and present the initial results of that. I'll go on to talk about some new work we've done following the initial submission of this paper to fine map the genome-wide significant loci and SNPs, um, as well as some downstream functional um, investigation and go on then to talk about the gene set analysis and partitioning the signal from that analysis in a way that I think is informative. That then led to some questions we had um, in the natural selection realm, and I'll come on to talk about that analysis, which has been led by um, Dr. Antonio Pardinas, a postdoc who's sat beside me, and, and I'm sure will welcome questions relating to that analysis. And just the final thing to say is that this is still a pre-publication stage. Uh, it's available in an earlier iteration um, on bioarchives, and that's the bioarchives paper, and as is inevitable following reviewers' comments, which I think have been very helpful and have genuinely led to, to an improved quality and, and to us reinforcing the messages of the paper. But of course, the number of authors has roughly doubled in that effort. Um, and I'll come on to thank those people individually as you go through the data. I think some of you may have seen the archives paper, uh, the bioarchives paper. We've updated that analysis. I'm going to try today to touch on um, the main reanalyses that we've undertaken, which, as I've said, are, are consistent with the original messages, but I think reinforce them. So, firstly, to give an overview of the Clause UK sample. This was a sample that we acquired over the last five years, really. Clozapine, for those who don't know, is an antipsychotic, which is largely reserved for those with treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And in fact, the only licensed indications for the drug in the UK, and I think pretty internationally, are for treatment-resistant schizophrenia or psychosis in Parkinson's. And we, through work with the Human Tissue Authority and the Human Tissue Act in the UK, allows you anonymous access to routinely collected samples, and we got ethics um, to be able to do that as part of the mandatory monitoring process for clozapine because the drug is associated with a rare side effect, a granulocytosis, which necessitates very regular blood samples to be taken. 
So we managed to access those samples and then used a clinician treatment resistant schizophrenia diagnosis that was also available for the samples in order to arrive at uh, what we thought would be a robust schizophrenia sample after excluding those with non-licensed indications or other diagnoses. As part of the paper, we've actually conducted some more extensive work looking at clinical validation of that diagnosis. So taking within our independent, more routinely collected research sample, those with a clinician diagnosis of treatment resistant schizophrenia who are on clozapine, and then looking at the predictive value of that in using as a rubric the gold standards and research diagnosis. And we get a positive predictive value between 91 and 98% for that clinician diagnosis and being on clozapine as having a research criteria uh, schizophrenia diagnosis depends on how you, how you, whether you have a narrow or a broader definition of schizophrenia. So I think that is really reassuring. Um, so we were then confident about running this as a schizophrenia GWAS and after deduplicating this sample and excluding those that were related in the, in the PGC and thanks to the PGC schizophrenia group for allowing us to do that, um, applying stringent population QC and imputation against 1,000 genomes and the UK 10K study combined, which has shown to improve imputation, particularly at the lower allele frequency spectrum. Um, we arrived at, at this GWAS, we applied pretty conventional uh, wider QC, and after that QC, we're left with uh, just over 11,000 CLOS UK schizophrenia cases, and roughly double that number of controls that haven't been used um, previously in schizophrenia GUAS. So that, that included the CLOS UK samples that were collected as part of the first iteration of CLOS UK and were included in the PGC2 paper. But this sample adds in those, those second wave of CLOS UK samples that were recruited as part of this Crestar EU project um, that we led the genetics work package on. And that's a, so we included in this analysis over 5,000 new cases, and as I say, nearly 19,000 controls that haven't previously been included. These are those samples in a little more detail. And so you can see here the previous CLOS UK1 samples that we reported in molecular psychiatry a few years back and then, and then contributed to PGC2. So these are the new samples, along with the second iteration of our more conventionally recruited schizophrenia sample in Cardiff. And then a whole host of control samples, and thanks for any of the collaborators that contributed to those. They include a lot of people in the PGC. Um, and these were selected on the basis of being UK-based samples or UK ancestry samples, um, which were typed on Illumina chips in order for us to maximize the common SNP content across the platforms. And this is just a little more about that because I think this is an important aspect of the study. So um, very quickly, a PCA output of cases shown here in blue against controls in green shows us what we knew from the self-reported ethnicity data that there were a large proportion of people um, of non-European ancestry. And that's to be expected given the constitution of, of where these samples were from. Uh, that's confirmed by this admixture plot, which shows the proportion of ancestry based on European, um, Asian and African in the samples. And you can see here a minority who would have majority African or Asian ancestry. And then we restricted subsequent analyses to those in red on this lower figure um, and went on to examine those in more detail. So this is then the GUAS sample after the PCA that were selected and um, so as I've said already we excluded those of non-European ancestry and relatives and that left us with 11,000 cases and double that number of controls. It's a very clean data set as the admixture plot shows again and when we plotted that against the clinic locations, the origins of the sample, um, this was reassuring as well. So these are only available for the new samples but nonetheless was reassuring. So red in here is England, blue Scotland, um, yellow Northern Ireland um, and then green is God's country and as you can see um, there's separation as these people rise to heaven 
um, on the PCA2. Um, and that was generally reassuring for the QQ plots as well. So I think this all re reassured us um, as to the, this GWAS. And the GWAS um, that we then conducted gave us 18 genome-wide significant signals. Four of those were novel. And we can see some of the usual suspects. It's probably worthy of note that just within this in now relatively small sample, we get a genome-wide significant signal in the DRT2 locus. Um, and also some new, new signals as well. Um, but really the purpose of this was to be able to amalgamate it with the wider PGC and the polygenic overlap and genetic correlation, which was very high, reassured us that that was a sensible thing to do. And just of note, the SIP-based heritability on the liability scale for this quasi case size 0.29. We were also able to conduct really uh, reproduce the results um, from the PGC paper in this decile sense. So this is taking the PGC samples that are independent of CLOS UK as a training set and then using polygenic score analysis targeting the CLOS UK sample split into deciles according to the polygenic score, both cases and controls. And this is the typical pattern whereby as you move up the polygenic score, your odds ratio of being a case compared to control um, increases and on the lower um, pane you can see that here we represent the case proportion and remember that there's a two to one control to case proportion to start with so you're getting some specificity particularly at the upper deciles. The power of this closed case sample as a target sample also allowed us to go finer grain in this respect and the next slide depicts this. So this is centiles as opposed to deciles and what we can see is that, so again, this is training on independent PGC targeting the whole CLOS UK sample. Um, and really that the enrichment in odds ratios goes um, substantially greater once you get above the sort of 90th centile value, and particularly in that 99th centile, by which time you're looking at an odds ratio of around 35. This is compared to the lowest centile, um, so it's pretty liberal in that respect. I think the equivalent of this compared to the mid-centiles was around 12 to, yeah, I think 12 to 13 in odds ratio. Um, but nonetheless, greater specificity of prediction um, and these kind of target size data sets allow us to do that. If you compare the proportion of cases, then at the upper centile, we're getting over 75% of cases. So we're getting better statistical prediction. We've modeled this with sensitivity and specificity, and you're still not getting useful clinical prediction, but we're certainly moving in that direction. And perhaps to reinforce that, if we take the full PGC sample and then target just the new clozapine samples, what we call CLOS UK, then in the same analyses, you get an odds ratio of about 96 um, in that upper centile compared to the lower centile. It's a wide confidence interval, but nonetheless shows that the progress you can make given the power, the increased power in a training set and a reasonably sized target set for these polygenic analyses. That then reinforced for us that we could take these results and combine them with the PGC given the overlap between the two samples. And as I said, using a polygenic threshold of 0 0.05, we get um, a very strong polygenic overlap. The genetic correlation um, states the same. And actually, if we just look at the new cases, we get equivalent results. So we combine the two, and this is really the crux of the subsequent work that we've, be, we've been doing. And that gives us a total of just over 40,000 cases and nearly 65,000 controls. We use metal and fixed effects to combine that. And then just refilter based on the PGC um, thresholds and QC uh, for the, for the meta-analysis and got a reassuring LD score regression intercept and, and lambda 1000, the QQ plot looks, looks okay for that. And this is the Manhattan of those results. Antonio's going to go gone to great lengths to make this um, colorblind friendly in the, in the coloring. And so what do we get? Well, we get 179 independent um, genome-wide significant clumped SNPs. This equates to 145 genome-wide significant loci, 50 of which are novel. Um, 
And of note, 93 of the previous 108 PGC schizophrenia loci remain genome-wide significant. Reviewers of the piece were, were wanted to explore that further, and Peter Holman's using an adapted method from um, Bowden and Dudbridge has shown that actually that doesn't mean that those 15 that don't replicate aren't true, that in fact this, this result of 93 uh, remaining uh, genome-wide significant is consistent with all the PGC 108 loci being true positives. Um, the, that method allows for um, adjustment for winner's curse in a replication sample, and so that's very reassuring. The reviewers also asked us to look at uh, nominal replication of the new loci, and we did that, and thanks very much to those that participated in that replication. Um, we, through iPsych, Ole Andreasen and colleagues in the top Norwegian samples and the decode samples, so all these being independent of PGC, and that's confirmed, and um, given us a replication in inverted commas sample, which we know is still empowered for proper replication, but nonetheless has served the purpose here of just over 5,000 cases and then a big number of controls, mostly the decode controls. And that was reassuring in that a sign test for the 50 novel loci and came out as very significant within that replication sample. I think 15 were um, nominally significant, and given the underpowered nature of the replication sample, we see that as being um, strong support for these being genuine and validated loci. What did we do with those? Well, this is new analysis that we've undertaken, and as I say, is one of the analyses that I think has strengthened the approach. So we find that. Um, the genome, the SNPs within the genome-wide significant loci. We use that data then to inform um, some chromosome confirmation analyses, which was led by Dan Geshwin's group, which I'll come on to talk about. And then also looked at co-localization using SMR um, with the common mind data. And I'll just touch on those results. So first of all, um, the, the fine mapping and high C. So Heijun led on this. Dan was. Uh, really welcome collaborator and contributed as well. We based, so first of all, we used fine map to fine map the GUS loci and took those SNPs um, that contributed to a cumulative posterior probability of 0.95. That left us with just over 6,000 credible SNPs. Um, the chromosome confirmation analysis was performed on the Geschwind high C data. So this is fetal, um, brain, two regions of the fetal brain for the high C analysis. And just for digest, so just to be able to digest these results, we've then restricted um, in this display and in the paper to those with a fine map posterior probability above 0.5. And that leaves us with 25 um, SNPs <coughs> that map to um, genes, some of which are we already know about. I've included all of them here, and I, I appreciate this is somewhat busy, but I'm gonna just select what I think, uh, uh, yeah, some of, the, some of the important results. So firstly, perhaps, um, this is a very well-known SNP that's emerged for some years. It's certainly reassuring that this is also emerging from the high C analyses, and um, particularly given the downstream uh, biological and, and functional analysis that, we, that has been done on this SNP and it's so this um, emerges from both the high C brain regions in, and implicates capital 1C so nothing new there but reassuring and certainly high C has been informative in that sense. I just highlight a couple of others so this is a non-synonymous um, SNP in a gene that has emerged in schizophrenia before but um, is in here because of its High posterior probability and the fact that it's functional um, and also points to um, a potentially interesting mechanisms. So this is that metal ion transporter that's involved in glycosylation and because it's not so on the SNP it's obviously particularly interesting so, so we highlight that and that's the index SNP of that locus as well I believe. And then we had emerged from earlier genic analysis that we've done um, several transcription factors. Well, RB Fox is a very known splicing factor. I think points to important um, pathology. It's also a very well-known autism gene from rare variant autism studies, and I think has given us clues to schizophrenia pathophysiology. And again, is a gene that, on which a lot of 
um, the biology of, of that gene and that gene family and its interactors and known effects. So that's uh, another important and interesting result. They went on to perform SMR. So this is essentially a way of looking at co-localization amongst the genome-wide significant loci between the GWAS signal and EQTL data. And this was performed on the common mind um, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex expression data in tandem with the common mind people, particularly Laura Huckins and Eli, as well as Pamela Sklar. Um, and really, we decided a priori to prioritize those co-localized signals where a single causal variant. Again, this is really to help with um, the interpretation of these results. So in this presentation, I've restricted to those with a heterogeneity p-value of above 0 0.05, um, and that's to make the results digestible, but also freeze of interpretation, as I say. Um, so that these are those loci where a single causal variant is implicated. We get 22 candidates which cover 19 loci at an FDR correction. So these are shown in this slide, and I'm not going to go into these in any individual detail, just to say that this builds significantly on previous um, SMR data, where I think five or six, or four or five um, SNPs and genes were implicated. Um, and so we're taking it forward there. And again, it shows the added power of increasing sample size. I mean, green here are the genome-wide significant um, SNPs adjusting for number of probes, but I think all these um, are, are signals that may be prioritized for further downstream um, functional follow-up. Okay, so just to summarize thus far, um, we found that using the genome significant loci and a combination of FIMAP, HI-C and the SMR analyses, we were able to assign potential causality um, to genes within 33 of the loci and individual single genes at 27 of these loci. So that's definitely an advance um, on where we were when the PC2 paper was published. I think we've been like much of Western democracy politics, overly conservative in this sense, um, for the reasons I've outlined already. But nonetheless, we see it as being a, a valid way for a first look at these data. We'll certainly make them more widely available. Um, on scrutinizing the data a little more, there's only one, D, one gene, the ZNF823 gene, where the signals intersect across those different approaches. And this perhaps points to the fact that we need greater granularity in this data, but nonetheless that they're very valuable and the resources that are becoming available um, and the analytic approaches should help us resolve GWAS loci, um, which has been a conundrum up until now. We certainly, I would make a plea, I know people are doing this already and we're trying to do some of this work, need more functional, um, comprehensive data that is tissue specific and probably across developmental stages. What's, it's been an incredible resource and will continue to be the Geshrin data, then that needs to be expanded. Okay, so following that, we then went on to do some systems genomics work and relied heavily on MAGMA to do this and use pretty standard um, approaches as far as the MAGMA analysis is concerned. What we wanted to look at, so we took a three-stage approach for this. Um, our first stage was looking at those genes that are loss of function intolerant and at that, at the time, had emerged uh, very recently from the exact um, rare variant pa paper that came out in Nature um, towards the end of last year. And we looked at those genes with a PLI score above 0.9 as recommended by the exact group and showed really quite substantial and strong enrichment for that as a gene set. We drilled down on that a little further. So by binning genes into their um, PLI score, because we wanted to know whether this was, um, well, how this relationship looked. And what this graph shows is that for PLI bins below 0.9 to 0.10, so this bin contains all those genes with the PLI above 0.9. Below that, there's very little enrichment in a competitive um, magma framework. So it seems to be restricted to those with a PLI above 0.9, which showed a degree of specificity. We've gone on to show that this result is um, not related to or, or is independent of brain expression and other functional classes. So it's robust to that and isn't explained by that. 
We then went on to perform two other um, gene set approaches. The first was a tailored one based on very carefully curated gene sets that we've reported um, in a CMV pathway analysis previously written by Andrew Popplington in Neuron last year. Um, and that used 134 what we call CNS-related gene sets that were, that were curated on the basis of proteomic studies, um, mouse knockdown studies, um, and other carefully curated gene sets. And when we performed that, we got 12 gene sets that survived the family-wise error rate correction, then ran conditional analyses on those 12, and six independent gene sets um, that survived that iterative correction, which I'll come on to explain in more detail. And we also then, really as a sanity check, did the full data-driven approach and threw all the gene sets um, that are available on these sort of generic gene set approaches um, and corrected for family-wise error rate for all these gene sets. The really reassuring thing was that those gene sets that emerged were, were equivalent between these two approaches. And so we showed that we can capture in a carefully corrected gene set the kind of signals that emerge in more data-driven analyses and the consistency across, across those two approaches was, was very reassuring. There was also consistency between the gene sets that emerged from this analysis and that that emerged from CNV analyses. And obviously they're completely independent. So again, that was pleasing, I think, points to, to pathology which traverses allele frequency bands. So these were those gene sets from the 134 CNS related analysis along with the loss of function gene sets in this table. Um, so these are the gene sets, the definitions of those gene sets, the number of genes in those gene sets, their p-value and corrected p-value and all of these um, were those that emerged from the independent conditional analyses. The gene sets masked with an asterisk are those curated from the most genomics informatics database and some of these you know, I suppose could in one way be criticized as being not that informative like abnormal behavior but nonetheless show that there's enrichment across broad, broad categories um, of, of phenotypic definition and then some um, become far more specific um, and I think are perhaps more informative if we're thinking about downstream treatment development. Um, but I think we wanted to put this in to show the context of the gene set analysis and you know there's some usual suspects it's good that fMRP comes out having been implicated in previous rare variant and to a lesser extent the common variant studies um, and as I say to put this loss of function intolerant gene set enrichment in context as well. I should have said at the outset but if anyone's got any questions then please let us know as we go through. Um, James, can I ask one question real fast? Sure. Um, so how did you, can you explain a bit more as to how the conditional independent stuff was done? So I, I presume that some, some of these things are going to have a lot of targets that overlap, right? Yeah, within MAGMA, it, it allows you to be able to do conditional analyses. So it was, it was done on the basis of magma in that respect so it's not yeah it's, it's an adjusted analysis not an independent gene analysis in that sense um, and i think it might i mean the, the subsequent slides part and the ld partitioned ld score regression speak a bit more to that as well to be honest the overlap between categories certainly got it so uh, did you look at the rb fox one binding genes with rb fox one two or three binding sites we didn't originally. We were then asked to do that sort of independently by Steve McCarroll. And whilst RB Fox itself emerged in the way that I've said and was in a GWAS locus, its interactors weren't um, enriched. Interesting, because RB Fox 1 came up as one of the main findings of the recent PGC2, MDD2 paper. So there were, there were, two, ah, different, right. there were two different hits that implicated RB Fox 1 and all the targets lit up too. Okay, okay. Yeah, that wasn't the case in this data set. And was that using magma or? Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, that's certainly interesting. Okay, so as I was just saying, and this speaks to Pat's point about overlapping genes really, we were interested in that and, and in 
nailing the origin of this signal really. And this depicts that. So we use partitioned LD score regression to be able to do this. I'll just walk you through this, what's called a nightingale chart that um, Antonio constructed. So the radius of the segments here indicates the heritability enrichment. And the dotted line is, is no heritability enrichment. So if you're this side of it, then it's enriched. If you're that side of it, it's depleted. Um, the, the angle or the arc of the segment refers to the proportion of heritability explained. And here we have um, the, the loss of function and CNS gene set overlap. So those seven gene sets on the previous slide, those that, the genes that overlap between those, um, this darker segment is the loss of function intolerant gene set that aren't in the CNS gene set. This lighter blue is the CNS gene set that aren't loss of function. What you can see is that for both of those independent, there's still enrichment, but the most enriched is the category um, across both gene sets. The other genic um, signal is indicated by this green um, color, and as you can see, is depleted, as are the non-genic signals which are depicted here and account for about a third of the, of the heritability. Just of note, so genic SNPs, and this is genic with the same definition as we used for the magma, 35 kb downstream, 10 kb up, upstream, um, but that accounted for nearly two thirds of the heritability, SNP-based heritability. And then if you look at our CNS and loss of function gene sets, the significant CNS gene sets, then they together account for about 39% of the SNP-based heritability heritability but actually they can only contribute to the genic heritability and they account for 61 percent of that so the the majority of that heritability which we can explain in this analysis is being explained by these those two gene sets taken together which i think is important and this just nails down into that area in a little more little more detail so on this side of this figure we've got and the proportion of heritability explained, and this is for each of those six CNS gene sets. Okay, and then we've got all genes, those genes that aren't loss of function, those genes that are, are loss of function, and then the same really, but this time, instead of um, heritability explained, this is heritability enrichment. And again, across all the individual gene sets. And really, the take-home signal here is that the greatest heritability explained is for the largest gene sets, FMRP and the abnormal behavior MGI gene set, which you'd expect. Um, and the enrichment is greater for the smaller gene sets, which it would have to be in order for them to, to emerge from this analysis. But really, the key finding here is that loss of function intolerant genes seem to explain the majority of the signal other than for FMRP. So there's an FMRP signal, which is independent um, and this time, not in an adjusted analysis, in a fully independent analysis um, of loss of function intolerant signal, um, which again is telling us something worthy, I think. Okay, so to summarize the system genomics, then we can see that with increasing the sample size, these kind of methods become quite powerful and the biological signals become tra tractable, I think. Um, that this loss of function gene set WAST is very large and doesn't tell us anything in and of itself about the biology. It's, it seems to be important in that it's the most enriched signal. It explains a lot of the other signal and is explaining a significant proportion of heritability. Nearly half the genetic heritability is explained by these genes. Independent of that, there's FMRP enrichment, and those targets are certainly something, a, a group of genes that should be. Um, should be prioritized. The other thing, just as a general point, is that there's value to well-curated gene sets. And I think I'll show that the majority of that signal is captured by these CNS-related gene sets. Whilst non-CNS gene sets were all in um, the analyses, they didn't emerge in this analytic pipeline. So that's worthy of note. Um, and then this raises the issue that in common variant studies, um, should we be taking into account and maybe waiting for loss of function intolerance, I think, and that's something we're exploring, I know other groups are exploring in other disorder GUIs as well. 
And this then got us thinking, really, I mean, if, if there are common variants in loss of function intolerant genes, how is it that they're persistent? In actual, in actual fact, more widely, how is it that schizophrenia risk alleles are, are persisting? And we know that those, well, the typical onset of schizophrenia is in a pre-reproductive um, age group. And so the disease should be having an effect on, on reproduction. Um, and indeed, that's been shown to be the case quite robustly now in several studies, but most, perhaps most notably in the Robert Power study that emerged a few years ago that showed there was a 30% reduced fecundity um, in schizophrenia patients. And that coupled with the fact that there's decreased life expectancy should mean that these alleles get selected against. There have been various counter arguments to that. Some people have made the point that the effect sizes are too small to be selected against, although provided little data to support that. There's also been a whole history of debates in the evolutionary psychiatry field about potential beneficial um, or balancing effects that might account for alleles persisting in the population. And that's something we wanted to look at. And this is something that Antonio Pardinas's uh, background in evolutionary and popula population genetics enabled us to do. So what we did was take the summary stats of the meta-analysis results and use LD score partition heritability again to be able to look at several metrics of natural selection. So these first three are variations on positive selection SNP metrics and this last one a background selection metric which I'll come on to talk about and really our hypothesis was more towards positive selection in this sense given previous um, hypotheses in this area this is the result so, of this analysis. James, yeah sorry to interrupt just a, a quick back one slide please so clarification, so this is mostly relatively recent human lineage selection, right? Yeah, indeed. Okay, did you think about going any further back, like to, you know, like a branch within primates or something, or why, yeah, why, did you, why did you select these as opposed to going to something that's a little broader? We, so we, I haven't got it here, but in the original paper, that we did perform a Neanderthal introgression um, analysis and Oli Andreasen's biological psychiatry paper was around that time as well um, but we didn't go further down that route because I think we were looking for this persistence signal so we wanted to look at specific selection signals rather than go down that route. I think I'll tell you if you got anything to add to that or? It was just more going back to the Linvod toe, toe paper from 2011 where there was a they made a lot of noise about the the primate specific stuff as well as the human specific stuff which, which I think is what you're getting at but it's more primate and then across theory in mammals so did you yeah we we did I'm, I'm Antonio by the way uh, so we did we we did uh, some we did some testing with the current annotations that I for example the the, annot, 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 the annotation from the limb black dot paper the concept uh, for conservation annotation is included in the NB score model and that has been shown to be enriched in schizophrenia. And we were looking into annotations that we could map to certain periods in uh, human evolutionary history. So for example, this CLR statistic, even though it says that roughly six, more than 60,000 years, actually it could go back, or the authors have claimed that it can go back to 240,000 uh, uh, years ago. So it's not, so it's, it's, a bit le, it, it's a bit more ancient. We struggled, I have to say, trying to find comparable annotations that could date back. We used the Neanderthal introversion annotation, and we, but we struggled to with finding annotations of related to positive selection that could go back uh, longer times, but of course we're, we're, we're open to expand this analysis, uh, this analysis in the future. But definitely a reason why we chose these annotations is that is because they have been consistently, they have been very well studied and the time frames were very well defined and also they were available genome-wide and we could, we could map all of these annotations to all of the SNPs. 
is something that doesn't doesn't happen for all of the other annotations out there. And I think they're recent. You know, these have emerged relatively recently. Some of these metrics, and so it was it was taking advantage of that. The other thing is that, as you said, the conserved across species story has been reported in the past, and we you know this wasn't a a posteriori hypothesis. We were genuinely looking for, for reasons why um, these alleles persist. And so this, this um, analytic approach we felt would, would inform that and give us clues to potential mechanism, um, which I think they ended up doing. So. so just to go on and describe these results. So this is the first iteration of these analyses. And we thresholded um, on um, genomic values across these different um, metrics and really what this shows is that um, so these are the positive selection um, annotations and this is the background selection and as you can see so a value of, of enrichment over one is enrichment below one is depletion and so there's no sign of enrichment in any of the positive selection measures but there is in this background selection measure and there appears to be um, a dose effect and this goes to to point five, the top 0.5% of the genome as well and, and is further enriched there. Just to note, I mean, you'll see that this depletion, significant depletion in this CLR measure, and as Antonio said, that's an oration positive selection measure, but also one that takes into account um, the background selection statistics. So in that sense, this is probably telling us um, a very similar thing, the depletion in this statistic um, mirrors with the enrichment in the background selection. And I think appropriately, uh, we were then asked to explore this result in a bit more detail and several questions um, arose as a result of that. So one of the first was, is this confounded, confounded by your methodological approach, particularly the thresholding? And we've shown that not to be the case. So these results hold when we use the new quantitative LD score regression approach. And the other, uh, I think, valid potential criticism was that they were somehow confounded by uh, functional, functional categories, and we've shown that not to be the case. So, using an adaptation, um, using LD score regression tau c, which allows you to adjust for um, functional categories in this case, it, what, it doesn't seem to be an effect of LD. We've, we've adjusted for LD effects. It doesn't seem to be. Um, other functional annotations such as the conserved regions um, and indeed there's a background selection signal which is independent of the loss of function intolerance signal and independent of brain expression so everything we've tried to do to make this result go away um, hasn't worked and it's it's a result that seems robust to these detailed and and i think time consuming downstream analyses but ones which have reinforced for us um, the, the validity of the initial result. We've also enlisted um, further expertise in the evolutionary genetics field to look at the feasibility of these results. So one thing is, is that this background selection result does give us potential mechanism. Um, and that's because we know why background selection can select, or, or rather allows persistence of these common variant signal, and that is by increasing drift. So essentially, and background selection imparts a reduction in the affected population size, which allows drift of um, neutral or mildly deleterious variants to rise in, in frequency in the population. And this provides a mechanism for how they persist. The second is, is this result feasible? And so um, these colleagues have modeled this, and I'm not going to go into any detail of that, um, but Antonio's really led on this work and gave a recent talk to the PGC stats group, which is available um, at that link provided there. Um, but I think what they establish is the feasibility of this being a mechanism in the various modeling um, approaches that they've taken. They, as part of that, for the first time, as far as we're aware, derived selection coefficients for common variants um, in this context. And that showed us that for um, SNPs with odds ratios down as low as 1.05, I think, that this was a potential mechanism whereby they could rise in frequency in the population given the kinds of um, prevalences of schizophrenia that, that we know. Um, so again, this was reassuring and, and reinforced the initial result. 
So just to summarize on that lateral selection um, analysis, we didn't find um, any evidence for enrichment in the positive selection metrics. So I would say that we've been in touch with Ole Andreasen and his group um, about these results and their reported um, enrichments in the Anderthal um, pathways aren't inconsistent with this result. They took a different analytical approach and, and I think um, our, our results will hopefully inform their thinking in that respect in the same way that theirs did ours. Um, the background selection result, as I said, um, is a significant enrichment which isn't accounted for by um, any difference in methodological approach or in including functional annotations within those models. And this seems to indicate that it's drift rather than any sort of selection which explains um, these findings and the persistence of uh, risk alleles in the population. And this is compatible with what we see in the reduced fecundity and also is compatible, although the background selection and loss of function intolerance aren't the same thing, it's compatible with the enrichment we see in loss of function intolerant genes. Okay, so just to um, complete then, so this is Antonio and I thank him for being here today and for all the work he's done on this. Also thank my Cohen and Mick O'Donovan um, for their continued support with this work and they've been intellectually very engaged with, with this work over the last 12, 18 months and probably beyond, as have several other people, particularly I know Peter Holman's in Cardiff who's, who's um, contributed to this work in a substantial way. And as ever, PGC um, collaborators and analysts have, have really helped with a lot of this analysis. I'd also like to thank the, the pharma partners who've cooperated in a hands-off way completely, but enabled us to gain access to these samples. And also um, those at Mount Sinai and in Dan Geshwin's group and all those that have contributed any samples at all, as well as our funders. Thanks very much for listening. And I'll take any questions you may have. Fantastic, Jerome, uh, Jerome Jesus. James, thank you so much for the, the cool talk. It was, it's really, really interesting stuff. And I've um, been jotting down about a million different things I wanna ask you about, which obviously I won't do now. Um, for the people who are on the call, I believe there's a way for you to quote, raise your hand, unquote. Um, if you go and look, and that would indicate that you wanna ask a question. And if you do, I will click on you so that you can. Um, if you're feeling too shy about this, um, use the chat feature to send me a text um, and that can, I can ask the question for you or you can send it to James directly. Um, James, you might want to open up the chat uh, uh, box on the side of your screen so you can see what's going on. So any questions, please think through some questions and raise your hand and I'll ask James one while people are getting their question formulated. So just to Go at this again. So the, the the one of the cool results of the paper was the possibility of you know the relationship to background selection, um, and obviously the p-value reported there was at some sort of large scale you know ten thousand foot view of the genome. Presumably, you can also use that to identify specific genomic regions um, that might be uh, more highlighted. Is that the case? Can you actually bring it down to the gene or locus level? So it's a property of SNPs, the statistic. So in that sense, it's not designed to do that. Reluctantly, we convinced Antonio to do it though. And so we did, um, in response to reviewers' comments, uh, derive genic-based scores. Now, background selection isn't a property of genes. That's the first thing to say, but it's, it's feasible that you can get genes with higher background selection and low background selection. So in that sense, there's some validity to doing that. And we also wanted to do that in order to take different analytic approaches to, to reassure us of the, of the validity of the results. And when we did that, actually, so we, used, we assigned um, magma based, well, we, ass we assigned a background selection statistic to genes and then use the quantitative magma approach, and that those outcomes were completely consistent with the LD score regression approach as well. So whilst there were methodological 
reservations about doing that, it reinforced the results. And, and I think it's something that Antonio is probably likely to explore further in the future. Right, because where, where I'm going with this, obviously, is that you know, you've got a number of things which come at the concept that you know, certain regions are, you know, don't tolerate variation very well. You know, presumably that's part of the selection, the depletion of background selection that you found. Yeah. But you also had the PLI result. You also had the, the widely replicated LD score regression results showing that, you know, it's, it's, it's Eutherian mammal conserved regions which have the signal. I'm just trying to say, you know, can you use those three different ideas to sort of pinpoint some regions or that might be important? Because I think mechanistically, that's really a key question. I mean, yeah. to, to look at this from the, you know, the, the 10,000 meter perspective is kind of interesting. And, you know, we'll, we'll certainly engender a, a whole fleet of books and opinion pieces, thank you very much, uh, <laughs> using, using the, the typical evolutionary arguments that can sort of explain everything or nothing or whatever. But the, the point that I'm getting at is, you know, can this actually be used to sort of pinpoint more precisely regions that we need to look harder at? Sure. And it, it's something where we're exploring. And I think you're right in that I mean, maybe the most fruitful areas will be the intersection of, of these different annotations. So, for instance, if you take the loss of function signal, then um, the thought is, is that, well, we know that if you've got a um, rare mutation, of large effect, the background selection won't be in operation in that. That, that variant will be selected against, negatively selected against um, strongly and disappear from the pool before background selection and drift have had a chance to act on those variants. But there will be SNPs, the common variants within those loss of function um, genes that have a lesser effect. And that's the key that these variants have to have a mild effect in order to be in order to be in within background select, selected regions that may be more informative and which and which would give us focus to to try and yeah to try and get more specificity from this this signal. I mean, we, we we were looking at it not for that reason, but as an explanation originally for that loss of function um, finding because for common variation that is counterintuitive, I think, in some respects. Uh, but but you're right that I think we we do need to move these results forward to the stage that they can inform further biological insight as much as they can, rather than just you know, result in fifty opinion pieces, as you say. Although our feeling was that it might perhaps perhaps wrongly that it might restrict those opinion pieces rather than allow for more opinion pieces. Good good, good luck with that, James. Um, <laughs> All right, so um, no, there are no questions, so I'm going to ask another one. And again, if please, please, please ask questions. We've got 10 minutes. This was a fascinating presentation. Um, I, I really think we should hear more. Um, the, the next question I wanted to ask you, James, was about the whole fecundity thing. So yes, people have been, you know, th there's a widespread uh, you know, observation that people with schizophrenia have fewer children. Um, and there's, I, I'm not going to get into the deep and, and long-standing uh, epi and gen epi literature on this, but I guess I wanted to target one question. Why do you think this is? Do you think, in fact, it's, there's, because there's sort of three things I can think of. The first thing is that um, the loci that, that you're getting at, or the biological processes that you're getting at, increase risk for schizophrenia and also mess up fecundity in some basic way. In other words, the genes that get messed up um, have some, you know, uh, side effect on human development, uh, wh which basically renders a person unfit at some, you know, stage. Yeah. Second question, um, and this was actually uh, sort of pre sort of hinted at by an analysis that Irv Gottesman did back in the '60s, where he she showed that there wasn't much of a correlation in the sort of mating in people with schizophrenia back in like the '60s. And Irv actually predicted that with halfway houses and whatnot, we're going to see a lot of that. And we actually showed that in Sweden, where there was a, a marked uh, overall effect of a sort of mating, but it was predominantly when a male had schizophrenia um, uh, versus the other way around. Hence, the, the question was, you know, is what's going on here some version of schizophrenia leading to people not being able to do the human mating dance very well? And as a consequence, that's the result of, of lower fecundity. Um, do you have any comment on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I should say from the outset, I don't know that our data inform um, that discussion at this stage. I think if you look at the other conditions in which, well, it's, it's going to be diff difficult to separate those two things, in my opinion. So if you look at the genes in which it seems they've got you know, larger background selection signal, then we know those are overlapping with loss of function tolerant genes. We know those are overlapping with neurodevelopmental genes, although they don't wholly explain that signal. But if you take some equivalent or related condition like autism, then you could make an argument for the genes for, for some action through the genes being responsible for that decreased fecundity. But equally, you could make an argument for some phenoty indirect phenotypic effect being responsible for that. I think the really interesting result, and one which we're trying to explore, is that um, reportedly in depression, that um, there isn't this decreased fecundity effect. In fact, it might, there might be increased fecundity associated um, in those with depression and that's you then predict that the background selection signal would be um, would be depleted in depression genes and that's something we're actively pursuing. We should look at that because there were some interesting pattern of genetic correlations with MDD with uh, was it earlier age at menarche earlier age at first kid and greater number of children. Yeah it is intriguing isn't it and, and actually when we were so we, I should say we yeah, we, we did find a degree of specificity for the background selection signal for schizophrenia. So we've gone on to look at um, three other phenotypes and using that tau C adjusted analysis, it's only schizophrenia that remains um, significant um, out of neuroticism, Alzheimer's and type 2 diabetes, which are the other phenotypes we chose. So there's a degree of specificity, although we wouldn't you know, as ever with complex psychiatric genetics, we wouldn't ex expect that signal to be exclusive to schizophrenia, but, but certainly it isn't a common, um, a common property of any neuropsychiatric or chronic disease. Okay. Well, James, uh, wait, there's a question finally. What do we got? David Curtis asks, um, can you see the, can you, if there, uh, down at the bottom there's a Q&A thing? Oh, yeah. So uh, David, David asks, what about new mutations occurring being balanced by lower fecundity, old mutations disappearing? And then a second part, also, what about the notion that selection pressures may have been much less in a geographical and social conditions pertinent through most human evolution as opposed to now in modern civilization? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, your analyses directly speak to the first one, doesn't it? Or is this something where we're going to have to actually see a whole bunch of whole genome sequence to really know? Because, you know, the, the exon stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think the, so the first point is the fact that these are common variants. And so they're not new mutations in an evolutionary sense. Um, and so I, I don't think that explains, if that's what David means, I don't think that's what, explains our, our results. Um, and there's certainly amongst these common variants, there's going to be some very old mutations. So I, yeah, I don't think it's a case that the older mutations are disappearing for the common variants and they're being replaced. Um, and then David's second point, yeah, so, sorry, thanks David, you, you accept that point. The second point I think is, is a reasonable one. So this is the idea that schizophrenia may be more disad disadvantageous now than it used to be because of geographical and social conditions and yeah I don't know I mean I suppose that that is an alternative explanation for why common alleles well does that explain why common alleles persist I don't think it does actually well, no I, I think no I think I, I like his point in, in the sense that, um, okay, so if you go back 100,000 years, life expectancy was what, 20, 25, 30 years at most. And, yeah. you know, people typically started having children a lot earlier than they do now, right? And, yeah. and, and often the age at which you'd have your first kid was before the typical age of onset of schizophrenia. So 
Yeah, no, it is. It's, it's a good point, and I suppose it goes along with the notion that you know you don't find large effect common variants in a in a condition which has a peri reproductive age of onset, as opposed to macular degeneration, Alzheimer's, etc. So yeah, yeah, that's a point well made. And then David added another clarification. Yeah, so David says that he meant not much selection pressure, which is exactly mm -hmm. the point. Mm -hmm. just stated, yeah. And he's right, because there were those studies from the 60s, right, where they looked at uh, schizophrenia across culture, and um, there was certainly, you know, indication that people um, from what were called third world countries back then did better. Yeah, although I think subsequent data from those same countries has called that into question, hasn't it? That's the, that's the old IPSS studies, the International Pilot Study of Schizophrenia Study. I, I think we've got some Ethiopian collaborators who've reanalyzed um, that data and called it into question. But I, I think it's a point well made. Okay, and I believe we're at time here. So this was an absolutely fascinating um, talk. James and colleagues, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing this paper when um, it comes out and good luck with the, the submission. Thanks very much indeed and thanks again for the invite and happy to um, take further questions and speak with people obviously, so just give us a shout. Absolutely, and, and perhaps if there's more questions, we can start putting this on the PGC Schizophrenia um, uh, group chat. Great, and I should say for those interested that these samples are within PGC3 and we're hoping for further advances with that. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Peace, Pat.